think we've got to recognize that cinema really most often functions as soft propaganda. It's a soft sell. The Americans were the first to realize that, even before the Soviets, back in 1917, 1918, Americans were realizing that American cinema, just ordinary American cinema, was all good propaganda for America. In fact, there was an official committee that said, everywhere people are watching American films, they're learning American values, they're coming to you from the screen without appearing to be trying to influence you. It's the American way of life. And I guess American cinema has always benefited from that sense that it's not seen as propagandist, mostly. It's just seen as telling stories. And that, of course, is a form of insidious, pervasive propaganda. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state. Well, I think the most striking difference in attitude after the war is that while American cinema gets really quite mobilized in terms of Cold War propaganda, this on the whole does not happen in the Soviet Union, the other player in the game. Here's the news bulletin from the nation's capital. Washington, officially this morning, denies rumors of enemy planes over northern Alaska. Meanwhile, there's been no lessening of international tension, and informed sources refuse to discount the possibility of all-out war. Shut that thing off. The space race was something which we had already seen in fiction. We already knew the stories from way back in the 19th century even, and certainly in the early 20th century. And I think people have always looked to space as a, a setting, an arena for acting out fundamental human dramas, but also, of course, the, the propaganda battles of the Cold War period. And the fact that science and technology could actually deliver these feats for real was wonderful, of course, because it was like something which had been anticipated coming true. So when the Defence Initiative, which eventually became known as Star Wars in, in the popular press under Ronald Reagan, which was to shoot down rockets with rockets, it sounds like science and fiction. And there were serious doubts on many people's part about whether it was realistic, feasible. It sounded good. You could do animations on television. And let's not forget that the whole support for the space program and for space-based defense initiatives has always relied on very powerful visualizations being available to be shown on television. Fire their radioactive rays. I think it's important to, to realize that the Russian interest in reaching outer space um, has got deeper roots than perhaps anybody else's. It's really uh, an old idea in Russia came out of the 19th century. It's a mystical, almost religious belief that somehow it's the destiny of mankind to reach the stars. And that was believed by a lot of people. It's not confined to the left or the right, or the religious or the irreligious. It's somehow rooted in the Russian psyche, almost. And it explains a lot about why Russia became so invested in the idea of rocketry and reaching space. When Russia succeeds in launching Sputnik in 1957, that is a fantastic trigger to America. Uh, it's like a wake-up call, like no other wake-up call. And suddenly, all America's formidable resources are focused on meeting the Russian challenge. If they've got a satellite in space, we've got to get a satellite in space. If they want to put a man in space, we've got to put a man in space. And uh, as we know, that became a real race. I think the American attitude to space was significantly different from the Russian. It's always had the association in America of popular fiction. If it's not Jules Verne, then it's Edgar Rice Burroughs, the Martian stories, the Venusian stories. It's, it's kind of a bit schloppy. It's space opera. America, I would say, does not have its own indigenous serious history of aspiration to reach the stars. In a sense, it's all, it all comes out of popular fiction. I mean, the, the whole idea of the countdown to zero before the blastoff actually comes from a movie from Fritz Lang's film, The Frau im Mond, The Woman in the Moon. Then it takes on very much a military dimension and the military potential of having a vantage point in space becomes a dominant theme in the post-war world. 
Get the Pentagon. Class A emergency. The Joint Chiefs of Staffs are expecting the call. The rocket has just been entered by a robot. Space exploration in Soviet cinema is remarkably idealistic. I mean, there is one film known usually in English as Battle Beyond the Stars, a 1959 film, which does very much um, posit a space race. It's basically the Russians versus the Americans. And that film was actually bought by an American company, recut with most of its propaganda content removed by a very young Francis Coppola and put out as a, you know, a space movie. That does show a, a competition, a race. Who can get there first, a race to Mars? But I would say that that's very much in the spirit of the Russian space race, not being seen so much as competition, but being seen as the aspiration towards a higher stage of existence. It's something which is very idealistic. However much it might have been supported for military propagandist reasons, its roots lie in an almost mystical Russian belief that reaching the stars is a good thing in its own right. American cinema is very much focused on competition with Russia. Anything they can do, we can do better. At the bottom of that lies the whole question of nuclear capability. I mean, the bigger, better rockets you've got, the more able you are to threaten the other side. When worlds collide, written in the stars is a message of doom for this, our world. And now in the most shattering experience the screen has ever given you, Paramount tells what could happen within your lifetime when worlds collide. An astronomer checks and double checks his horrifying discovery. A distant star racing through space toward an inevitable collision with this planet. The United Nations meet in emergency session. I think there's a very strong theme in American post-war cinema of locating the threat in, literally, invasions from outer space. Just like any Saturday morning. And American popular fiction of the post-war period is full of the fear of contamination and the belief that somehow this, this threat that you can't quite locate is all around us but it's also coming down from the skies and it's, it's very powerful and it's been very closely linked with the fear of communism, the idea that communism is a, an alien invasion which will somehow take over our communities without us knowing it. The kind of films where we see this most, most clearly are films like It Came From Outer Space. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, I think, is probably the one that stays in many people's minds because that seems to be so much a parable of the anti-communist hysteria of the period. People all around are turning into pods, snatching the bodies of your friends and neighbours, and that's like, you know, communism is potentially taking over your sons and daughters and members of your family. Farmers, Grimaldi, Pixley, Kester. The clearest example of science fiction in Britain picking up Cold War themes would probably be the, the Quatermass series in its various forms on television and on the big screen. Because there, it's the old invasion from outer space, but it's something which is lurking beneath the surface. It's, it's almost archaeological. It sort of taps into notions of the, the primeval, something that's beneath our feet literally, and it's also kind of tied up with a sort of mysticism about the ancient world, about older generations, things that are coming back to haunt us. I think there's a kind of post-imperial aspect to it as far as Britain is concerned. I think that's, that's a very distinctive British take. It's also rather kind of cosy and homely. <laughs> it happens, you know, in, in a tube station <laughs> or in, in a part of the home counties. And that sort of sense that it happens in the most unlikely most undramatic setting, I think, is very British. Oh, there'd be the old girl. What? Over there in the house, she'd be inside. They're not going then, she's dead. She must be, it's no nah, good. Look, leave me be. I think American upfront anti communist films have never been very successful at all. I mean, the, the nearest you come to that probably would be the Manchurian candidate. And I have here a list of the names of 207 persons who are known by the Secretary of Defense as being members of the Communist Party. What? And the Manchurian Candidate is a very, very particular film, very powerful and well-known film. If we may proceed with the demonstration. It comes out of the Korean War and the idea that somehow 
the Koreans and particularly the Chinese, their allies, had superior powers of brainwashing so that they could actually plant brainwashed people as sleepers in American society. It's like an extension of the, um, the, the science fiction theme of being taken over without knowing that you're being taken over. They can make me do anything, Ben. Can't they? Anything. We'll see, kid. We'll see what they can do and we'll see what we can do. I think it's interesting that when you look at American cinema, you tend to see it as being essentially about the triumph of the individual. And mostly it is. Take a look at this kid. The great American genre is the Western. And the Western is, above all, about individualism, about standing out often against the crowd and of being true to yourself and winning because of your integrity. Listen, this is me, Marco. But I think American cinema, which is also global cinema, is more complex than that. And I think there is an aspect of American cinema which knows very well that it has to play with different audiences and actually leaves a certain amount of space for people to make of it what they want to make of it. And a very good example of that is one of the biggest blockbusters of all time, Avatar, James Cameron's film, which I think is a really interesting film because on one level, it's a story of resistance to ruthless imperialism, ruthless economic imperialism. The bad guys are the guys who want to take over this planet and to loot its resources. And the natives of the planet, the Na'vi, the blue people, as it were, are fighting a, a traditional war of resistance uh, against these, these ruthless um, asset strippers. The central figure, the protagonist, is somebody who is given a chance to join the Na'vi. So he's like, he's like the double agent. He's the man who goes native, joins the Indians, if we're thinking in, in Western terms. And through that experience, through being allowed to join them by so superior technology, of course he comes to share in their struggle and he sees how his own comrades are perceived by the Na'vi. And what's really interesting about that film is that it's been taken up in a number of parts of the world as um, an allegory of liberation struggle. There are protests that have been staged, for instance, in Palestine. People have painted themselves blue and said, we are the Na'vi. We are standing out against the military machine that's against us. And uh, there are many examples of how people have found in that a parable suited to their needs. Is James Cameron just being clever, producing a film that works for different people? I think he's being clever, but he's also doing something which American cinema kind of has always known it needs to do, which is to give spaces for people to produce different interpretations. Where are you? What do you look like? What am I supposed to be looking for? I know you're out there, hiding in the desert. Maybe I'm looking right at you and don't even see you. Come on out. What, John? 